Hello, I'm Michael Lawrence, Chief Executive of Asia House, and welcome to this conference titled How Technology Can Shape Soft Power. We have a global audience. Good afternoon and evening to those joining us from Asia and the Middle East. Uh, good morning to those in Europe and a very early morning to those on the West Coast of the United States. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, this conference, as I said, is titled How Technology Can Shape Soft Power, and our, fo our focus will be the instrumental role high-tech companies can play in amplifying a nation's soft power and the shifts we're seeing globally. Today, we are launching a new report, Fuel the Soft Power, the Role of High-Tech Companies in Soft Power, and it's produced or co-produced by IE University and CKGSB. Soft power is defined as a country's ability to influence the preferences and behaviors of various actors in the international arena, that states, corporations, communities, the public, through attraction or persuasion rather than coercion. Well, one of the findings of the report is that high-tech companies and products serve as a potent tool for promoting a country's soft power. And that's the central theme which we'll be exploring today, how harnessing high-tech companies' branding and products can shape international relations and drive trade and drive economic growth. In a few moments, I'll invite Professor Ma Bin of IE University to brief us on the key findings of the report, after which we'll discuss the future of soft power with a panel of experts. It's an interactive session. We welcome your questions and comments. More on that a bit later. But first, let's look at the current use of technology as a soft power tool and the role high-tech companies can play in cultivating positive perceptions. To deliver today's keynote address, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sean Randolph, Senior Director, Bay Area Council Economic Institute, who joins us now live from San Francisco, despite the fact that it's one o'clock in the morning. Sean, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, I apologize if it looks like I'm in a cave. Uh, it's pretty dark here at one in the morning in California. But I didn't want to miss the opportunity to be with you for this conversation because I think it's an, an important one. Uh, so I'll speak in these opening remarks just to start to frame the later conversation, uh, really from a Silicon Valley perspective, because that's that's really where, where I work every day. And uh, the premise that I'd like to put out there is that technology is really the key source of soft power in, in the 21st century. Because uh, thinking from a Silicon Valley perspective, more than half of all the most highly capitalized, highly valuable companies in the world are actually Silicon Valley based, and everyone is a technology company. And so that kind of gives a sense for the kind of corporate capacity uh, the places like Silicon Valley and other places around the world that concentrate that kind of uh, uh, corporate presence uh, have the ability to project. So if, if we start with maybe with the idea of soft power and what makes it powerful, I think one way to look at it would be that traditional soft power is largely cultural. You think about things like democracy and the touches on people's aspirations or U.S. or British culture, you know, often through music. Uh, these things touch the daily lives of large numbers of people around the world, generally in, in, in a positive way. So I think technology is, is quite similar. If we think about the innovations we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, that Google has revolutionized how we around the world find and manipulate information. Uh, LinkedIn has powerfully influenced how we connect professionally iPhones have revolutionized how we communicate with each other around the world. And now AI, at some point, is going to touch just about everything and, and everybody. So technology, like culture, uh, affects large numbers of people in their daily lives, uh, not always, but generally in, in a positive way. Uh, and that's, that's soft power. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that this isn't just about large, highly developed economies. I think India really makes an interesting example where Google currently accounts for 99.6% of all mobile phone searches uh, taking place in India today. Uh, 
India is WhatsApp's largest market uh, anywhere in the world. It's Twitter, or I guess now X is the third largest market in the world after only US and Japan. And it's LinkedIn's second market in the world after the US with about 90 million users as of 2022. So you think about all those people who are using this technology, and of course, they're aware of the source of it. And I think that's really a, a very, very powerful influence because th this is driving, that is supporting the economy, it's supporting people, farmers out there who are using mobile phones and other things to, to sell, sell their crops. There's a strategic component to this as well, of course. Uh, sticking with the India example, if you look at the statement coming out of the Biden Modi summit from last June, uh, it was all about technological cooperation in, in a wide variety of fields. And I was in a session earlier today with uh, India's foreign minister, Jai Shankar, and he said it just very directly that technology is at the very heart of the relationship. So <clears throat> the connections that these relationships provide uh, and the identification of the users with the technology and with the source of the technology, I think, reinforces broader societal and political relationships. And it's really a handful of countries in the world today that have the ability to uh, project soft power in this way. So if we bring it back then to the example of what, what happens in Silicon Valley, uh, in our institution, we've counted more than 350 uh, governments, often through a diplomatic presence, uh, international organizations, globally headquartered uh, corporations, that have a presence here almost entirely around technology. Uh, uh, these are corporate innovation offices, there are R&D centers, there are corporate venture capital firms, university and scientific off offices, they are uh, startup uh, and scale up accelerators, and, and they, they come from absolutely everywhere. They come from across Europe, they come from China, they come from India, they come from North America and, and elsewhere. So the suggestion there is that technology exerts a gravitational pull that in turn powers the exchange of people and human capital as in our experience, entrepreneurs and investors and technologists, as well as government leaders continually cycle through because people want to be there. They want to be in places where this, this is happening. And then there's a new phenomenon, which is tech diplomacy, where many governments are actually designating a global technology ambassador to put their country right in the mix of the conversation with the companies around regulation, around innovation, other things. And I think European countries have really been in the lead, certainly in the US, of creating uh, global tech ambassadors here. Uh, so we get a lot of visitors from around the world. And Every case, it's guaranteed what they want to talk about first is, is investment, and they're looking for technology investment. They're looking for data centers, they're looking for a Tesla factory, uh, semiconductor fabs, a Google center, uh, as they try to develop their own technological capacity to be more competitive. And, and this affects employment where, for example, in Ireland, Apple employs 6,000 people. Uh, uh, Facebook employs 5,000 in Ireland, Intel employs 5,000. If you go to Israel, the largest private employer in Israel is Intel with about 14,000. So there are big economic impacts to the kind of presence uh, these companies provide, uh, in addition to uh, the kind of stimulative effect they may have on technology development and the spin out of startups that come out of these larger R&D centers and, and companies. And, so the investment also supports this human dimension, the movement of people back and forth that again, uh, deepens identification, a, a deepens mutual ties. And I think, again, I would use maybe just two examples of Ireland, where a lot of multinational corporations, certainly from our part of the world, have their uh, European headquarters. Uh, they're hiring locally, they're moving personnel in and out of their R&D centers to the Silicon Valley headquarters uh, local hires in Ireland start their own companies. Many of those that come to the headquarters in Silicon Valley stay there, but they end up with deep relationships of familiarity, familiarity with both, where they're really almost like dual nationals. If you think about Israel, venture capital firms from Silicon Valley are involved in just about every major investment deal taking place in Israel today. And the US is the primary global destination for startups as they grow from Israel into global markets. And so 
We've counted more than 500 Israeli founded companies just in California alone. Uh, these are startups, many of which now have grown to, into five or $10 billion companies. So, so sort of the bottom line, where, where, where does this lead us? Uh, I think one observation might be that the soft power of technology can be diminished if it's used instead or used too much as an instrument of hard power. And we could discuss in a variety of ways how this may be playing out uh, currently in the relationship with China. Uh, technology has certainly become a field for global power competition. Again, uh, some of the US-Chinese tensions, pretty obvious what's been going on with Huawei, uh, US bans on the export of semiconductors and semiconductor equipment. Uh, also, we're seeing some of this in global efforts now to realign global supply chains for critical and emerging technologies. Uh, so I, I think the bottom line that, that I would take away just as a framing thought for the conversation that's coming is that uh, there's a case to be made that as the global economy uh, digitizes, and I think digitalization really, if it hasn't impacted every industry in the world, it, it, it will sooner or later, that digitalization and access to that technology is going to be a core determinant of a country's prosperity and of its competitiveness. And the capacity of any given country to innovate is going to determine whether or not countries move up into the top tier. Now, it, it may be that regulation will in some way affect uh, the kind of influence that countries and companies are going to have uh, and their ability to project uh, their influence globally. We're seeing that in regulatory debates in, in the EU right now. We saw it play out in a somewhat different way in, in, in India. But I think despite those regulatory uh, currents, uh, I think the, the influence of these companies, the pervasiveness of the technologies are going to continue to grow, driven by their global market base and by the enormous investment resources at their disposal. And this is going to apply both to large and small economies and to developed and less developed economies as well going forward. Again, as we look at the, at the global economy uh, rapidly continuing to digitalize and looking for the source of that digitalization, the source of the technology that empowers that and, and implements it. And, and I think that's really going to be, again, uh, if not the primary, a primary source of uh, soft power well into this century. Sean, thank you very much. A very comprehensive look, especially at the power of the Silicon Valley companies. And I was struck by, and I'm still still trying to reconcile the the you know the tech power competition and the source of tension between China and US is, is often around tech with the uh, soft power implications of these big brands. But Sean, stay with us, please, because now we'd like to hear about the report and its key findings. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Ma Bin, who's academic academic director of IE China Center, assistant professor of leadership and behavioral science, IE Business School at IE University, who joins us now live from Madrid. Professor, over to you. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you. And hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here and uh, share some insights from our uh, latest report from our IE China Center. So let me share my screen first. So continue with Dr. Randall's idea of um, uh, like the comparison or rivalry between United States and China. These days in terms of soft power, uh, we started to look at this, uh, what we're doing or where we are at this moment and trying to use these analysis to predict what will happen in the future or what's the benefit we can get globally out of this uh, situation. Uh, before I step into the current uh, report, I would like to take a minute to uh, introduce our center. So at IE University, especially at our center of uh, China, we try to understand the economy rise of the Chinese uh, businesses and the global operations, and also to understand new business practices or policies that, again, that can be uh, um, 
beneficial to the global economy. So in line with these uh, stories or focuses we have, we have launched uh, several reports in the past few years, focusing on entrepreneurship, family business, entrepreneurial passion, et cetera, with a focus on the Chinese economy. So this year, we look at the soft power, especially the comparison between United States and China. And uh, what is soft power? Uh, if we look at the literature or the previous research, we know that's an influence or a attraction to others through cultural, societal, or political means. That means it's an influence. However, it's not pressed in a hard way, but more in a soft way. And the reason we want to understand this, of course, first of all, like uh, Dr. Randolph said, it's uh, uh, competitive, complicated, and collaborative world that we're living in. So soft power is actually very influential in our international community. And it shapes the global economy and international trade relations, etc., in many ways that are arguably even more important than hard powers can do. Specifically, I believe uh, these three elements are the hardcore uh, elements of soft power, or in my words, the softest of the soft power. First, culture and value. That's the cultural expressions and uh, including the products of music, movies, etc. And education and science, that's education system efficiency and scientific outcomes, including research, new technologies, etc. And lastly, business and the economy. That's the operation of the businesses and the, its contribution to global economy. And like I said, in this report, we're going to focus more on the comparison between United States and China and with a benchmark country of South Korea for the following reasons. First, South Korea is a developed economy in which share a similar cultural root, Eastern Asian cultural root as China. So it shares similarities uh, uh, with these two comparison uh, countries. And uh, the second reason is that South Korea has an observable rise on its soft power in the past decades through, for example, their music, K-pop, and also their uh, cultural products like TV shows and uh, movies. So let's dive into our uh, survey data and uh, uh, results. We surveyed 10 countries uh, across the world, trying to gain a more uh, representative result of people's perspective, globally uh, speaking, about these two countries. And these are the basic demographics of our sample. And you can see in terms of age distribution, gender, education, employment, and even social economic class in terms of annual income, our sample is very well distributed. That means it provides a very good solid foundation for us to be confident on the results uh, emerged from this data. So first, in terms of cultural and value, here are the results we get from the, uh, the data. Uh, if you look at it, you realize, unsurprisingly, United States has been demonstrating a dominance uh, cultural influence globally, which has always been the case in the past decades in the historical uh, development of economy. And uh, But if we look into it, we can see in developing economies, China, as well as South, uh, South Korea are rated uh, a little higher, okay? So that's our first observation from our uh, data. Second, moving forward to uh, education and science creation. 
These actually, uh, we would find some uh, well expected, but still surprising in its uh, scope. Um, that across the 10 countries we surveyed, six of them rated China higher than United States. That's including, again, the investment for education system and uh, the new technologies, science outcomes, including research papers, et cetera, as well as the future leadership position that's in the science field. So we can see Canada, Mexico, Israel, Germany, UK, and South Africa all rated China higher than United States in this general uh, field. And especially if you look at the only country we surveyed in Africa, the difference is quite significant. So that may uh, reflect the investment and uh, uh, involvement of Chinese companies, et cetera, in Africa, African market. Business operations and economy. And uh, this again, we can see United States has always been and still is on the top across all the surveyed countries. But once again, we, we can highlight the developing economies of Mexico and South Africa. And you can see they rated China significantly higher and much closer to the United States uh, rating. Okay, so this is a general simplified version of our findings regarding the comparison, the current situation in terms of soft power between United States and China. As you can see, in terms of cultural and values, business and economy, these two dimensions, the soft power of United States is showing its dominant positions in front of our uh, uh, sampled participants. Uh, however, in the technology and the education, our global audience started to recognize that China is investing heavily in this field and may become more leading roles in the future. Now let's step further to the role of high technologies and high-tech companies. So I agree uh, with Dr. Randall saying that high technologies or high technology companies are actually a product of this, this uh, uh, soft power. For example, if we look at Apple and uh, Apple products, it's a reflection of uh, the American culture and value. And it's based, based on the advanced technologies and the science in this uh, education and the science element, and it reflect a global operation of a successful uh, business, right? So all of these three elements of soft power actually re uh, created all these high-tech companies that we are looking into in this report. And uh, of course, here we have one company uh, from United States as Apple representing it and uh, uh, with Samsung for South uh, Korea. And then we have four uh, uh, other companies from China to represent the situation in China because the focus is to understand the Chinese soft power and uh, its economy. Uh, on top of this, I would say the way that high-tech companies feel their home country's soft power is because they play an ambassador role to communicate with their customers about their home country's values and home country's influence through their products. So if we look at these companies and uh, 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 the familiarity and consumption of their products across the 10 countries we surveyed, we can see Again, Apple represent the United States. It's on the top of the familiarity and consumption rate, followed by Samsung, very high too. 
And then we can see there's a variety of these Chinese companies. However, with no obvious leading role across all countries. Of course, we can see TikTok is more popular in the two developing uh, economies and uh, other, other products are more, you know, uh, 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 like on average across these uh, countries. So this gives us an idea of how uh, the Chinese brands and high technology companies are standing comparing to Apple and Samsung uh, in front of, again, our global audience. Further, if we look at each company and how much they represent their home country, by asking our audience, when you look at this, this company, how do you think about, uh, uh, like how much do you think they represent the culture or the image of their home country. For example, Apple in terms of United States, that 90, almost uh, more than 80% of our audience would say uh, it represents United States image. And Samsung, it's 70%, uh, Huawei, almost 70%, and other companies are slightly lower representation comparing to the first three. So what we are looking at here is first, companies like Apple and Samsung, they really indeed play this ambassador role to communicate their home country values and the soft power to their customers through their products and services. And in terms of the Chinese tech giants, I would say there's no leading a uh, company that can be so representative in terms of Chinese value and culture. However, you can see they're growing rapidly and getting close to that point, okay? So a highlight of our key findings is first, the United States still has a long established soft power dominance. That's with no doubt across all the three elements that we're looking at. And second, emerging economies like Mexico and South Africa in our sample showed a higher recognition of Chinese business and economy influence. And the next, the majority of the surveyed countries, six out of 10, actually recognize uh, Chinese education and science systems higher, rated higher than United States. And lastly, the high technology companies feel soft power of their home country by communicate to the global market uh, uh, customers through their products. This is an uh, ambassador role that high tech companies and products can play uh, in terms of representing their home country's soft power. That will be the simpli simplified version of our uh, annual support on the comparison of soft power between China and the United States. And you can look into our uh, full report from our IE China Center website. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you very much indeed. I'll ask you now to take your screen off, Chef. Thanks so much. Uh, very fascinating stuff out of there. So I I'd now like to go to our uh, panel discussion, and I'm joined by Mona Lawson, who's Head of Soft Power Research and Insight at the British Council, Jonathan McClory, who's Partner at Sanctuary Council, uh, Xu Weilei, who's Professor of Managerial Practice at CKGSB, who's joining us from Shanghai, and Professor, if you can stay with us too for this Q&A. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, Mona, I, I'd like to start with you, if I may. The concept of, of soft power, it's widely used, but does it mean the same thing to everyone these days? And this particularly as the world becomes more complex. Well, thank you for, 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 for that question. And, um, you know, the, the term soft power is not controversial and it's actually widely, widely criticized, but also so widely used. Um, you know, to, to, to get others to want what you want, I think is a short, shorthand for the definition of Joseph. Now, it sounds simple and desirable, and often technology companies can, can really do that very, very powerfully, both for themselves and for a country. Um, but, but traditionally, the, the concepts of soft power rely, relates primarily to the nation state. 
of course, it's also been used um, in the context of cities and can logically be extended to big national, um, international um, non-state actors, such as the big multinationals and tech companies and, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, <laughs> These companies are not traditional practitioners in the soft power field. And of course, soft power isn't a practice in itself, mm. uh, but rather a, a capital resource that actually is generated from a country, country's different entities and characteristics and their ability to attract and instill trust and set a positive ex example. And so in order to have a meaningful discussion about technology companies and their role in countries' soft power, it's perhaps useful to think about the the, the, the distinction between the outcome of soft power versus the action and interventions that can generate soft power and also think about the, the main sources and assets of soft power. Mm. And, um, you know, the soft power is earned over time and sometimes through quite deliberate interventions, but oft, often actually as, as secondary and tertiary effects, effects um, of the activities and, and the institutions working internationally. And some companies may be very up for supporting uh, their country's soft power, whereas other companies or institutions who may have a technology role may be actually less comfortable about that. And that may vary from one country to, to, to another. So I suppose, <clears throat> um, hopefully, technology companies will mostly be a, a positive contribution, but success will depend on a proper understanding of the dynamics. Um, and that, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in the best sense, uh, the contribution of, of a wide variety of actors, including technology companies to a country's soft power, creates huge opportunities for making more of a difference. But it also presents some quite serious challenges, I suspect, in terms of the, the me mechanics of actually organizing this. And for a country and for a government, that probably also represents a challenge in terms of um, presenting a coherent picture and a co coherent offer and finding ways of achieving that sort of a coherence. So I think it's complicated and mm. success is, <laughs> is uh, perhaps not guaranteed, but very, very likely if you can get it right. No, you make a fantastic point there. And Jonathan, I'll put that to you, that tech companies are not traditionally players or actors in, in the soft power space. Some of them may not want to be major actors in the soft power space um, and some of them are the subject of huge political scrutiny themselves and i cite TikTok here which is you know mainstream news amid concerns in some countries that about TikTok and the data and and its its, its influence beyond you know the, the the app itself what's your reading of the situation is soft power becoming just simply more complex uh and uh and therefore harder to to see where it might land yeah, well, I think you're right, Michael, um, that consumer facing brands traditionally have had uh, an impact on a country's soft power. Um, but as you say, te technology companies are being dragged not into the, the world of soft power or a country's reputation, but actually into the cut and thrust of global geopolitics. Um, that, I mean, that shouldn't really surprise us. Technology has been part of global power competition, you know, since the dawn of history. Um, you know, more recently in history, we we saw this in the the space race between the Soviet Union and the U.S. Um, but now it's not just space. You know, it's not esoteric, high-minded uh, uh, science, but it's computing, it's AI, it's microchips, it's life sciences, it's the green energy transition. It's impossible to separate technology from great power competition, given the way the world is going. And I think it's worth a quick word on the state of post-pandemic soft power. Uh, which is a key component, obviously, to overarching global geopolitical power. Um, and that's namely that technology and technological capability has become more important in the calculus of soft power itself, how people see countries, how they how they shape their perceptions of them. And Sanctuary Council actually carried out research during the pandemic in partnership with the University of Southern California's Center on Public Diplomacy. We were looking at how the pandemic had impacted both the balance of, of global soft power but also how people form their opinions of other countries. So again, the calculus that people use um, in, in assessing their attraction uh, to a country. So, you know, the weighting of soft power. And what we found is that factors like arts, culture, tourism, to an extent values, while I want to stress still important, 
have fallen in relative importance to national attributes like competence, government performance, perceived safety, uh, global contribution, scientific innovation, and of course, technological capability. Um, so essentially, you know, and, and this has been the case for a while, but um, and this is borne out in, in prior research of mine around the soft power 30 um, and, and other researchers that basically what a country does, what it contributes to the wider global commons is, is what, um, what ultimately shapes perceptions of that country. Um, but basically in a kind of post pandemic context, and I think one where technology is front and center of, of national competitions, those factors of, you know, scientific innovation, technology, they're, they're moving up uh, the table in terms of what is going to deliver the most impact of, of soft power. So the component parts that, 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 that bring outcomes to soft power are changing and have changed. Pandemics accelerated that technology because of its advancement is, is now much higher in the list. That's right. And, and that's what we found in this uh, prior research with uh, USC. Yeah. Okay. Professor Xu, come to you now. And I want to look at ask you about China's soft power and how that's developing, because one might argue that it was relatively close to the US in some countries on some scores in the research that Marbin pre just presented. Um, but some might also argue that it's lagging behind given its economic growth over the last three, four decades. Yeah, okay, Michael, thank you very much for questions. Uh, I was also very amazed by uh, Bing's finding uh, it's really, you know, uh, sort of like a very you know, innovative and also creative, you know, uh, study uh, to analyze the impact of soft power for both countries at a comparative level. Okay. Now, I think uh, uh, China has uh, historically uh, have some soft power, but it's uh, soft power is more like a, a regional base. So, for example, uh, when you talk about uh, Singapore, talking about uh, Malaysia, talking about Indonesia, I mean, uh, China certainly has uh, quite, you know, deal, you know, soft powers. Uh, but over time, I, I think when China's economy grow, I mean, it's no longer, uh, you know, taking the regional level, but it's more like a, to the international or global level. So when we're talking about the global level, we're talking about the Europe, we're talking about Australia, we're talking about the U.S. So uh, at that level, I think uh, China still have lots of room to grow. Uh, and that's from the, uh, my perspective in terms of soft power at the regional and global level. And uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I think uh, you know, what we can do uh, as China uh, as a whole, you know, can uh, increase the soft power. Uh, Here, I would like to raise two points. Uh, in the paper, I mean, we're mainly talking about at the country level, okay? But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I would also like, like to emphasize uh, on the firm level, which was not in the paper, uh, which I think is also very important. But uh, uh, to in, in general, on the on the country level, I think uh, China can uh, still, you know, I mean, I mean, China has achieved lots of you know, economic success uh, globally, right? I mean, everybody can recognize that. Um, but I think in order to uh, enhance the soft power, uh, which means you need to have the capacity or capability uh, to influence the consumer of other countries and also the elite of other countries. Uh, you have to not just, you know, emphasize the economic story in terms of uh, the, 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 the successful story in terms of economic performance, but also more broadly uh, as, uh, you know, social narr narr narrative, you know, which emphasize on non-economic side as well. So this is something I think China can do uh, in the next couple of years in order to increase its soft power. Okay? But that, this is at the institutional level. But on the other hand, I think at a firm level, I think it's also very important because it, it is essentially uh, these companies' actions that create the whole country's image, right? So when we talk about firm level, China actually uh, did very well uh, globally. For example, uh, Bing's, Bing, in Bing's report, Bing talking about uh, TikTok in the US, right? Uh, TikTok is, uh, is, a, is a very good company, you know, uh, creating huge impact in the US market. And, uh, but on the other hand, it also receives strong uh, interrogation from the government, from the US government, right? So this is the one thing I think the companies should think about. How can they can, you know, uh, incorporate, uh, in other words, uh, create a more open-minded, uh, like more inviting, you know, uh, conversation uh, with the host country, uh, especially the institution and the government. And not only uh, the government, but also other institution uh, sites, such as the uh, the, the scholar, the, 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 the financial institution, right? The policymakers. I mean, this is the one thing TikTok should think about. 
Uh, there's also another company which is called uh, uh, Xin. I'm not sure whether you uh, notice that company. The company is doing extremely well uh, in the US market. Basically, they sell the female uh, uh, apparel, uh, the clothes uh, online, okay? And uh, I think this is, this valuation is, is already uh, exceeding like, uh, I forgot the, the numbers, maybe more than 30 billion US dollars, okay? I think way more than, I guess, yeah. But, you know, last, I think two weeks ago, uh, European Union actually issued a report. Uh, so basically the report is targeting at Xin companies. So what the report says is, um, uh, the Xin is creating lots of, you know, uh, buzz in the US market and, and also the global level, right? But uh, uh, compare with Zara, because when, when we're talking about Zara, Zara is very, you know, famous uh, Spanish company. Uh, what they do is they are actually reducing the production circle, uh, you know, to 15 days, like from design to, or, or to, to, the, to the clothes to be put on, on the market, it's 15 days, right? But the Xin is actually increased from 15 days to one day or two days. That's, that's incredible. Basically, if you shop on every day, you will see the clothes, you know, changing every day, you know. So which created a huge you know, impact on the consumer side. But on the other side, on, on the other hand, the European Union will say, look, you know, when you when you when you put like when you change the, 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 the circle from 15 days to one days, you are really encourage some sort of like the waste culture, you know, you're wasting too much material, you're wasting too much, you know, the resources. I mean, because consumers don't want to change the clothes every day, you know. So, so I mean, this type of story is, is very important for Chinese company to learn. And uh, this further emphasize, in order to succeed, they should not only emphasize the economic success, uh, the financial performance, but also more importantly, how to incorporate uh, the social, um, maybe the, 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 um, the, 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 the justice, right? The, 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 the environmental, these kind of things, I mean, into their corporate strategies. I think that's a very important you know, issue to think about. Uh, so that's sort of like the, 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 the two level I, I would like to emphasize. Yeah. yeah. Professor Mao, was there any sense in the research that respondents were aware of the political tensions around some of the brands that you talked about? And was that having any impact on how they responded in terms of these big tech brands and their influence? So well, um, take one. I'm yeah, sorry, please. was that to me or that's for to you. Professor that's for you. Xi? That's for you. That's for you. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Taking one step back, uh, talking about uh, business and uh, soft power. Actually, if you look at the history of uh, China, uh, Chinese people are very good at communicating soft power through business. So if you look at uh, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, tea, uh, silk, and China, you know, where the products um, the Chinese people are selling to everywhere and then communicate their values to the global audience back then. And these days, I think the new product they are using to uh, communicate to the world is the new technology companies and their product. So this comes to your question about uh, how these products or companies uh, are playing a role in this uh, communication of soft power. Uh, I guess, first, if you look into these companies, for example, Huawei, it reflects the core culture of Chinese culture. For example, if we, we use a well-accepted cultural uh, model, for example, collectivism versus individualism, you can see Huawei is actually very collective and uh, the power is more centralized than many other American companies. And uh, if we also look at the long-term orientation, you can see Huawei actually provide a more uh, thorough solution for business problems than the rivalries, let's say Samsung and uh, uh, Apple, right? They have more product through the whole line of providing the, the a more thorough solution of uh, uh, business issues. And uh, also, if you look at masculinity versus uh, femininity of uh, each society, I guess uh, in terms of hardworking, achievement driven, that's also very Chinese culture oriented. And again, Huawei, uh, as one example, would represent that culture in their company's operation. And uh, also through their global, uh, global operation in other countries. 
This way they communicate, you know, these core cultural values of their home country. Okay, now look, if, if in the audience, if you'd like to participate, if you'd like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A box because I'd be very interested in your views, any questions or comments, and I'll bring them into the conversation. Uh, Mona, to you, I'd like to hear a bit more about the perception data that the British Council has put together. And as I understand it, it's perception data from G20 states to understand how they're seen because that, I expect, gives a sense of their soft power credentials. Yes, so um, we we ask the um, young people in the G20 um, about their perceptions of, of the rest of the G20 on, on a regular basis. And we ask people to rate different countries on whether they trust them and find them attractive uh, and so on. And we actually do some in-depth questioning around um, characteristics of countries that we relate to soft power from the cultural institutions, education institutions, the state of their legal system, uh, the country's uh, contribution to, to uh, uh, development aid and being a force for good in the world. And it's, it's quite interesting to see how, uh, and it, 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 the, the, our data shows that different characteristics play a different role for different countries. So I think for Japan, for example, you know, if people think that Japan has um, strong technology, innovation, science, uh, that actually helps shape their interest in, in consuming the culture of that country. And for the UK, it's slightly different. And, and thinking about the UK as, you know, the British Council's main interest of comparison, you know, it's quite interesting to see that the UK is not top, actually, for any of the characteristics we talk about. But you, if you look at, look at all of the 15, 20 char characteristics all put together, uh, the UK actually has the best average score. So um, it suggests that the UK as a country has a lot of different legs to stand on. And each country in the comparison may have a slightly different profile. So it may have certain strong elements that they should be investing and using more of in terms of if they want to really expand and their, their soft power. But um, um, so, you know, the, the, the countries that, who do best in general would be the um, high income Western mm. um, democracies who also have a, a high tech sort of um, economy, most likely. But it's also quite interesting to see how things shift. And, you know, in common with your report, you know, we see Korea just over the 10 or so years that we've been actually less than 10 years going back to 2016. You know, that country has crept up in the rankings across a variety of uh, dimensions, trust, attractiveness that we associate with soft power. And I'm sure the Samsung and the uh, <laughs> um, and, and car brands may well have a really powerful role to play in that. Hmm. Jonathan, is the, the survey show that the US is dominant in soft power and has been for a while and, mm -hmm. and Western de uh, developed economies more broadly have been dominant. But is there a shift? Are you seeing a shift that the the, the strongest soft power countries as the as economic growth shifts to Asia, as attention shifts to Asia, is also shifting and that the more powerful players are now likely to come from Asia? Um, so I, I would say yes and no. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, there, there, there's definitely that, that uh, drift of the center of economic um, and to an extent geopolitical gravity from West to East. Um, I had a front row seat for this, um, you know, three and a half years living and working in Singapore at the, the end of the last decade. Um, but when you look at Asia and soft power, I think there are a few winners and then it's a mixed bag otherwise. Right. So uh, we've been talking a lot about China. There are elements of China's soft power that have definitely uh, been in the ascendancy, but but it can be a bit of a mixed picture. Japan, South Korea, very strong on soft power. Um, certainly the, the data uh, uh, bears that out, and 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 likewise, I think the the trajectory of South Korea has been most impressive as as an example of how to do this well in a, in a strategic way. Um, Singapore as well has been very good. That's a decades long project. I think he wouldn't have referred to it as soft power, but Lee Kuan Yew certainly understood um, soft power and 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 country reputation. Um, I guess the irony is there's much more economic interest in in Asia and thinking particularly about Southeast Asia 
um, and I was there uh, just week before last. Um, I think that's probably going to be the most consequential region for the next, you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, that is the, you know, with with the greatest respect to the people of Southeast Asia, that is going to be the area of competition, I think, between the U.S. and China. And they each have a viable claim to influence in that region. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a, a great deal of ethnic Chinese living throughout the region that have a kind of cultural pull. Um, but some countries are more kind of free market and leaning democracy. Um, so there's interest there. But outside of Singapore, in that region, I think even as those countries develop economically, they're lagging in terms of their influence and soft power. Um, so I think Indonesia is a bit of a head scratcher. You know, you look at the the size of the country, the you know the economic, the growing economic heft of the country, but geopolitically, they're they're not much of a of, of a factor. Um, this might change, but we haven't really got there just yet. So it's a hugely important region, but it's not really making itself felt on the global stage. And that's one more point, I guess, is look at ASEAN, which is an important economic construct. But again, geopolitically, it's not a huge factor. I mean, you have some countries want to be dialogue partners. Mm. The UK put a great deal of emphasis on on joining uh, uh, as a dialogue partner to ASEAN. But you know, it's not a it's not an entity that really throws its weight around uh, in a way that it probably could. No, no, I agree. I was in ASEAN for the ASEAN summits in Jakarta a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, much talk about economic connections between the ASEAN states and an acceleration of that, but huge debate and and differences about what role it can play politically on a global scale. Uh, Professor Xu, to you, you've written before, I believe, about the development of soft power with Chinese characteristics. What is that? What do you mean by that? Um, I guess I have to uh, step back a little bit. You know, uh, I don't really mean, you know, Chinese characteristics. Uh, I think one of the important thing, uh, maybe you should call Chinese characteristics, you know, is it really to make a sort of like the value connections um, for Chinese company uh, with the global, you know, uh, stakeholders. Okay, so let me give you examples. Okay, which I think is very clear example to show what do I mean by value connections. So when Starbucks, you know, get into Chinese market, you know, Starbucks is making coffee, right? It's a coffee companies, and uh, they are actually selling coffee in a country in China, in a country which don't have coffee culture. You know, so so the, the, that's at this level. It's at the country level. It's certainly a country cultural difference, right? Because we don't drink coffee, we drink tea. Tea is a culture, right? Okay. But when stuff are getting into the Chinese market, I mean, they don't really emphasize they are, they are coffee companies, you know? So when you look at their mission statement, I mean, Starbucks has a very interesting mission statement. Mission statement. Their mission statement is not to become a coffee company globally, but rather to nurture the human spirit, one cup, one neighborhood at a time, okay? So what does that mean by human spirit? We are helping each other. We trust each other. We we support each other. I mean, this is this is what I mean by value connections, you know, because globally every country's people like this idea. Whether it's in Istanbul or in New York, in Shanghai, in Madrid, you know, we are human beings. We care each other, right? So this is very important, you know, uh, strategies when Chinese company want to, you know, go globally. I, I think that's a very important strategy. Okay, and here at CKGSB. Uh, oh, I give examples. You know, we have a student. Uh, uh, he, her company is doing like uh, the uh, the tissue. You know, the paper tissue. Okay. So when you're talking about the Chinese brand, you know, I mean, certainly uh, people will say, look, it's a Chinese brand. It's maybe the quality is not very good, right? But when 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 this company going abroad, that's very interesting because uh, they, they 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 don't emphasize on the tissue per se, okay? But rather they emphasize the way they make the tissue. So the way to make the tissue is through bamboo, you know, bamboo, it's, it's kind of, you know, a, 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 a plant, right? Okay. So what they say is, if you make tissue through bamboo, it creates sustained value for the whole society, because basically you save resources, uh, protect the nature. So the company have no resistance in the U.S. market. They go to Costco, they go to Whole Foods market, you know, they sell very well. So this is what I mean by value connections. So I think value connection is a very important, you know, uh, concept for emerging market company, especially Chinese company, uh, to go abroad when, when, when they initiate international strategies. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, Professor Mara, I saw you nodding at that. Is, is, is that a concept that came out in the uh, research, the, 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 the connections piece of soft power? I, I agree that um, this value connection point that Professor Xi just pointed out is basically um, showing or emphasizing what I care, actually you care too, you know, to find the common ground of what humanity should care. And uh, on top of um, what I just presented, actually in the report, we looked at some grand challenges, you know, uh, uh, that the Chinese government is is uh, dealing with that actually the whole uh, global society should pay attention to. And these things are where all these government-based giant investments are going. So for example, uh, uh, green technology, uh, high-speed railway, you know, all these economical, uh, environmental related areas are where the money is going, basically. So that's again, back to Professor Xi's point of uh, value connection. So what the Chinese people are investing in is something actually related with our grand challenges of the uh, global community. Okay, uh, and a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please do put it in the question and answer box and we'll bring it into the program, in fact. I'll go now to Lynn Kong of Asia House, who's, who's tracking the questions. Lynn, the first question from the audience, please. Hi, uh, we've got a question from Jiayang Wan. So um, nowadays it is very easy to perceive the geopolitics influence from the US government, pushing out Chinese high-tech companies, also big US tech corporations backed out, back out of Chinese market one by one. Should we accept the reality that one tech company could only choose one side in order for the business grow, to grow? Or should we consider third geographical uh, region such as Singapore as a better place for one company to set up in order to, in order to maximize its potential of international scale up? So I think that's a fascinating question. Do tech companies, are they going to have to make a choice? Are they going to be a Chinese, China-centered company or a US or, or Western-centered company? Jonathan, I, I want to put that to you. Oh, boy. Um, I, I think it'll depend on what the companies are doing. Um, if they are consumer-facing hardware like Apple, for example, Apple, one of its most important markets is China um, and will probably remain so. I mean, their stock hit uh, uh, quite a rough patch when the Chinese government made an announcement banning uh, Apple phones from, from government buildings. Um, and if that kind of continues, then they're in trouble. I think it's the software companies and those that are information focused um, that are going to have uh, problems. And I mean, you know, yes, the, the, the US government has subjected TikTok to, to quite a grilling. Um, but, you know, the the other side of that coin is that, you know, Google is banned, X is banned in China, you know, all of these platforms that come from the US are banned. Um, to, to the final point of the question about would would companies be better off coming from a place like Singapore? Um, yes, they would. But but many of the, you know, the tech ecosystem in Singapore is um, coming from, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're international companies that have set up a base in Southeast Asia. Um, I think there's, you know, a couple of success stories, but none that are going to be truly global and, you know, earth shaking or completely disruptive. Mm -hmm. The one exception may be being Grab, which has a big, you know, regional impact. Um, but I'm sat here in London and I can't, uh, you know, I can't use Grab when I'm here, only when I'm mm -hmm. in Singapore or Southeast Asia. Yeah. Sorry Dr. for the uh, clock going there. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Uh, Dr. Shu, same question to you. Are tech companies... Uh, likely at some point to have to make a choice because of geopolitical considerations rather than commercial ones. Professor Shu, that's for you. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, my suggestion would be um, it, it's a great opportunity, you know, for company to actually uh, make a connection between the, the two countries. You know, rather than, you know, uh, selecting one or the other, they can take a both and end approach. So that is that, that means they can actually building a bridge between different countries. I mean, that's their social responsibility, you know, to, to some extent. 
right? So this is my initial response, right? And, and this goes back to my point that uh, about the you know, value connections. So if they are adopting a value connection approach strategies, I mean, it, I, I'm sure you, you can find always find the commonality uh, between the divergence, and, uh, and and we always agree to disagree, right? And that's very important, you know, approach they should think about. Hmm. Mona, I do want to ask you the, that same question. Uh, you know, are tech companies likely in this very complex and more complicated soft power world, uh, they're likely to have to at some point make a choice which market they focus on because the geopolitics are just too tense to, to be global? I'm perhaps not the most uh, best qualified person to, to give advice on this, but uh, maybe it's an opportunity to talk about something that maybe relates to it and picking up from um, Professor Shi. Um, you know, we've talked about tech um, becoming more important in the soft power space. Um, Jonathan made that point earlier. But I think what we haven't talked about is that technology platforms are also something that we in the, 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 the practice of cultural relations, public diplomacy, we rely on these platforms too. Um, and as... Um, you know, different countries take different approaches, whether it's a public diplomacy model of the US, which is includes strategic comms or a, a French sort of cultural diplomacy model of, of showcasing or a British Council UK kind of collaboration um, or you go to Institute collaboration focused approach. You know, our success will increasingly depend on um, on having the technology to do it. And and we will therefore be relying on some of the, the technology companies, of course, you know, they will be making their decisions based on commercial <laughs> considerations. But, um, you know, and competition is part of that. But I do think there is an awful lot of talk about co collab competition um, and perhaps not enough talk about collaboration. And, you know, I accept competition is, is, a, is a fact. Uh, it's neither a good or, or nor a bad thing. And in the soft power space, actually, if, if, if competition is genuinely about being the most attractive or most trusted, whether that's through your arts or your technology, um, it could possibly even support uh, peace and prosperity, right? Um, and it's not a zero-sum game in that context and everyone wins. Um, I have to also say that uh, from my field in cultural relations, um, you know, the c collaboration has had the edge over competition for possibly the last 20 years. But it feels like things are changing a little bit and that space could be narrowing, whether that's a result of uh, great power competition, multipolarity and in international relations or economic harder times or even people not wanting to add to their carbon footprint. And um, it does make it even more important that there are actors who ensure that there is some collaborative space and scope for partnership across borders. And we all have um, some pretty ch fundamental challenges to solve to to you know to, to help humanity here and i think innovation and technology is really central to all of that and sometimes governments can't do it so my challenge to the tech and the private sector is to try and play a positive role in protecting the dialogue and collaborative space and um by all means compete but leave some space for um the non-zero sum version of the competition so Sorry, you're that was taking us in a slightly different direction. Okay, no, that's interesting. Collaboration and challenging the tech companies to keep that in mind in terms of, I guess, their, their greater role beyond their commercial uh, imperatives. Uh, Lynn, another question from the audience, please. We received an online question from Harvest Chen. How can the West and China work together in terms of shaping technology forward into the future? So that plays, Mona, to what you were just saying, collaboration. And Jonathan, again, I'll start with you. Is there any sense that China and the US can work together in terms of technology, given the deep divisions that exist and the, the escalating tensions? There should be, right? I think there's a, there's a, there are enough overlapping interests where they should reach an accommodation and see the, the, the wider benefits of collaboration. And it doesn't have to be purely bilateral, right? It might be better if it is multilateral. Um, but the areas that jump out to me, um, you know, most obviously because we felt it so acutely recently, but pandemic preparedness would be one. Uh, another would be the, the net zero transition, um, which, I mean, we know that China is effectively leading the way in its production of, of 
of uh, the sources of green energy, uh, particularly solar. Um, and then finally, this is really, really optimistic, but I think AI governance. I mean, the, the sort of the wheels of global governance have effectively ground to a halt. Um, but I think, both, you know, technologists and, and, and governments and policymakers are broadly agreed that some kind of framework on global AI governance is pretty important. Um, it's hard to see that happening in a meaningful way without China coming into the conversation. Uh, next month, there's a summit on on AI uh, and, and global governance that the UK is hosting. Um, and that would be a good moment. But uh, I, I don't know, that just feels really optimistic right now, you know, being uh, kind of realistic about it. But those are the three areas that I would certainly hope we could see some collaboration on technology. Yeah, it's interesting to me, to Jonathan, the, the, the flack uh, that was fired politically at um, the organizers in the UK for inviting China. And yet you're quite right, meaningfully, you had a meaningful conversation on AI regulation without having China in the room. But Professor Ma, I wanted to, to put that same question to you. Are there areas of tech where you would hope to see cooperation between the US and China? And is it around climate change? Is it around AI regulation? Yeah, so... A uh, quick answer to that is uh, definitely yes, right? Because uh, these days, as uh, what Mona, Mona said, uh, as humanity, we are facing way more common challenges than, you know, disagreement uh, in terms of all those grand challenges you just mentioned, right? And I'm very glad, glad uh, Jonathan mentioned AI. And uh, in order to deal with this new uh, new edge cutting technology we need uh, big data and all those you know engineering's uh, strength that uh, uh, china has so back to your question i do agree that in terms of all the grand challenges societal environmental challenges it is very possible and necessary to collaborate not only between the uh, united states and china but also all the knowledge generating uh, institutions across the world. Well, what we'll do now, we'll go to Lin Kong for the next question from the audience, Lin. We got a question from Sammy. Going back to Mona's early point that tech companies are not traditional practitioners of soft power. Could we soon be entering the world where the soft power, cultural influence, and rulemaking ability of tech companies actually supersedes that of nation states? I'd like to put that to a few of you, but I'll start with you, Mona, because that's where the question was directed. Is it possible that that tech companies will become so all-powerful and soft power that they will supersede nation states? Well, it's an interesting point, and... Um... You know, when I was thinking and uh, preparing for this um, this uh, panel, I was thinking about technology and, you know, its power and um, considering that it, it is neither benign nor neutral, whether it's a positive or a negative depends on who you are and when and where and, and how it's used, right? And a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's, it, it makes our everyday lives work smoothly. And we are totally dependent on it, and it's 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 made a lot of progress for us in the world. But um, it 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 isn't all that there are you know in the context of soft power, I suppose you know, the the eye is in the soft power is in the eye of the beholder, and um, you know if 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 companies become so big and have so much influence and so much soft power or so much power for themselves, you know, it isn't a given that that's going to be to the benefit of everyone. But if these large companies act for the benefit, not just of themselves, but for humanity, then it could be hugely um, positive. But, I mean, and also, yeah, sorry, yeah. There's, there's no doubt that, um, you know, some, some big companies have, uh, you know, you know the, the, the staff levels of small countries, the reach, of uh, same reach uh, uh, as, as big countries. And um, if we can harness that for good, so that would be a marvelous thing. But it comes but down I also to- I like the idea of the multilateralism a point that someone made earlier, whether it's in the context of US-China collaboration 
or uh, collaboration to solve the, the big issues of the world. And this is where the, the brands and the soft power of these big companies can help to convene. A lot but of Mona, it, come to, it surely comes down to what you consider to be a positive outcome for soft power, because a positive outcome for one nation state will be different from the positive outcome from another nation state, or indeed positive outcome of soft power for one corporate might be very, very different. So, so Jonathan, to you, some of the numbers, and I'll, I'll get to Professor Murray in a moment, showed that you know Apple, I think it was, it's seen by the respondents as, as 80% recognised as sort of US characteristics. Is there a possibility that these tech giants, which are phenomenally big and influential, they're likely to supersede, or they, is it possible they will supersede the plans of governments in terms of soft power? Yeah, potentially. I mean, on, on the regulation front, you know, they, they effectively have, uh, you know, I would say for the last couple of decades, it's it's kind of a, a cat and mouse game of, you know, the technology companies are way out ahead of the technical understanding of legislators and regulators, and then they play catch up. So you could look at something like the European Union's GDPR as catch up on data privacy. Um, and then there's something new, you know, an offshoot that, that again, legislators and regulators won't fully understand. And so, uh, you know, the leading tech companies are often able to set the terms of debate on regulation. On kind of overall soft power and influence, I, I, I mean, I agree with Mona that the, the accumulation of too much power is probably going to be off-putting in any context, right, whether that's technological or otherwise. Um, so I think there's a real risk, and ultimately it will come down to, you know, are these companies ultimately, are, are they a force for good? Are they giving me good products at a, you know, what I believe to be good value for money and not damaging society or the environment in the process? Um, then I think it, it it's fine. I mean, I think companies and governments will always reach an accommodation because, you know, they, they can't completely replace governments. Um, so I think we'll just continue to see this cat and mouse game, um, you know, where where regulators try and catch up and the most savvy governments will co-opt the good things of technology companies to bolster their own country reputation and image. Professor, my final word to you on this. And again, I was I was struck by that list of companies and how it was perceived by respondents of, of having the characteristics of representative of a particular country. So do you see these big tech companies possibly becoming even more influential than nation states? I would say first they are a product of their own uh, characteristics of the country. And then because they are playing this ambassador role, so they are communicating to the audience about those characteristics. But of course, if we uh, give it the time and uh, take an evolutionary perspective, maybe one day, you know, they would contribute to those uh, country level characteristics too. But I would never say they can be, you know, more superior uh, uh, influence over country level uh, characteristics. Okay, we need to wrap up our panel discussion there. Thank you all very much for a fascinating discussion and thanks to the audience. I know there are more questions. I'm sorry, we simply don't have time to get to them. So my thanks to Mona Lawton, to Jonathan McClory, to Dr. Xu Weili, and also to Professor Ma. Thank you very much. A closing keynote now by uh, Tao Zhujiang, who's Professor of Strategy Economics, Associate Dean for Global Programs, CKGSB. Professor, over to you to wrap up the session. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I would first like to congratulate IEE, IE China Center, Professor Ma, together with CKGSB for producing this report. I think it's a very timely and important report because of the heightened tension between US and China. You know, uh, we actually just had a lively discussion, you know, a few keywords, US-China competition, rivalry, South Power, high tech. It was meant to be South Power rivalry that has escalated into the trade war initiated by Donald Trump, the detainment of Huawei CFO, the banning of Huawei's 5G technology, and now the challenges being faced by TikTok in its, in its US operations. So, so as you may notice, Huawei introduced its newest model, mobile phone, May 60, May 60 Pro, end of August, while Apple released iPhone 15 on September 22nd. Now, Huawei is a privately held company, so there's no listing of stocks anywhere, while Apple is a listed company. The stock market response of Apple seems to suggest 
Huawei has done a better job than Apple, despite the fact Huawei has been blocked, has been actually denied access to advanced chips. The comments from the US Secretary of Commerce to the US lawmakers lend further support to, to this view. However, the US lawmakers call for even more restrictive policies against China, against Huawei. So yeah, the high-tech companies, Huawei, Apple, they actually feel the rivalry between China and the United States, not just soft power, but potentially hard power tactics. Now, it should be pointed out that despite the rapid economic growth of China in the last 45 years, and despite of the many efforts by China in elevating its positions globally, there is a long way for China to go before reaching parity with the United States in the soft power rivalry. I think this is the point made earlier by many, uh, many participants. Part of the reasons, I think there are two, two reasons. Part of the reasons is because, because, because of the lack of communications between China and the rest of the world. You can talk about language, language being one of the issues. You can talk about the channels of communications. It could be either traditional media or social media. You can also talk about COVID. COVID basically makes things even worse by cutting off communications between China and the rest of the world. So that's the first reason. The more important reason is that there is a media bias in the US newspapers against China, which affects how China is being perceived by people globally and ultimately China's soft power. You know, the Americans may say the same thing against China. You know, I, I have done research about US local newspapers, okay? So they are all together 147 local newspapers in the United States. What I discovered is that newspapers whose, whose circulation areas that suffer from the impost competition from China, they have a tendency to, to have bias in its reporting against China, its reporting of China. And they tend to endorse Democrats in congressional elections. The electoral success of these candidates leads to more protectionist policies against China. So, so this, is, this is the second reason why China may not do well in the measurement of soft power. So, so let me give you two examples showing that China is not good at communicating to the rest of the world about the success of its high-tech companies and the government policies against high-tech companies. So Huawei, so, so the first example is Huawei. Huawei has not had the opportunity to explain the reasons behind its success in 5G. Now before 3G, actually before 3G, the American standard for telecommunications was way better than the European standard. The problem with the American standard is that one single company, Qualcomm, owns 60 to 70% of the patents of the American standard. Meaning if we stick with the American standard, we all have to pay high royalty fees to Qualcomm. So amazingly, the, the European telecom companies decided to ditch the American standard and instead they, they stand behind the European standard. And Huawei being a private company is in China not a state owned enterprise in China. This is another misconception. While we had to go global, because you know it didn't really have the level playing field within China, while we happened to be betting on the European market and while we actually supporting was supporting the European standard. So the rest was just history. Okay. So 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 now of course Huawei is facing the same challenges as those encountered by Qualcomm in the past. Namely its dominant position 5G, which explains why the United United States has been hesitant to engage with a perceived monopoly. Another example of poor communications concerning high tech firms in China, ultimately China's soft power, is about the way the Chinese government deals, deals with monopolies in high tech industry. So, so a lot of people have a lot of, I mean, several, several people have a lot of talk about monopolies, the tendency for high tech firms to go beyond nation states, right? So high-tech industries are winner-take-all industries. And hence, you have to deal with monopolies, no matter whether they are from the United States or from China. In dealing with monopolies, there, there are a number of ways of dealing with monopoly, okay? And the Chinese way, actually, this is one of the three possible ways, is to use administrative measures called regulatory state approach Whereas the American government prefers using the litigation through court approach. 
So in fact, American high tech giants, including Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they have faced years of litigation from the American government. Now, although the Chinese approach is often seen as more efficient in terms of speed, concerns remain around its arbitrariness. So, so Alibaba is a perfect example. As the Chinese government recognized the downsides of e-commerce dominance and penalized Alibaba to address concerns about its power over suppliers. However, Western media has portrayed this Chinese government's move as a crackdown on a prominent private enterprise instead of its monopolistic practices. So, so this actually highlights a communication gap in conveying China's approach to dealing with monopolies, which ultimately diminishes the soft power of China. So what I hope to see is that high tech firms, no matter whether they are from China or from the United States, they can push for economic growth and development in the world, particularly in the less developed world. So in other words, I care less about the measurement or perception of soft power. Apologies to Ma Bing, okay, Professor Ma Bing. But I, but I care more about the tangible benefits brought about by high tech companies. So this is actually is the value proposition point by Professor Xi. I had a trip to Kenya in, in just a month ago, and I find that several Chinese tech companies have helped transform the economic growth and development in Kenya. The railway between Mombasa and Nairobi is one example. Another example is a company called Transion, headquartered in Shenzhen. It has been a leader in providing mobile phones in Africa. It's brand called Techno, no trace of Chineseness. Okay, so, so Techno is, is advertised virtually in every town of Kenya. So it is not a surprise that Techno is ranked among the top six brands in the whole of Africa for the sixth consecutive year. So Techno is behind brands such as Nike, Adidas, Samsung, Coca-Cola, and Apple. This is because Techno offers the kind of mobile phones, cheap, affordable, but good enough, the kind of mobile phones that Africans love to have. And I also learned that there's a Chinese woman born and raised in China, but educated in the United States. So this is about US-China collaboration. That's about farms in Kenya, helps Kenyan farmers to improve productivity through the use of better technology and business know-how. Now, one of the tourist attractions in Kenya is Safari uh, Masamara. You know, you, wherever you go to go to Kenya, you go to you go to Safari. It's a huge national park where lions, leopards, zebras, and many other animals live together peacefully. Before going to the safari, most people wonder how how so many animals actually live together peacefully. But once you get there, once you arrive there, you actually get to know why. Because Masamara is a huge place. It is 2.5 times the size of Singapore. When you have this much space, it is no wonder that all animals, big and small, can live together peacefully. And the same thing can be said about US and China. There's enough space for both US and China, all right? So, so uh, what most people really hope for is that the competition in high-tech industries can bring about real benefits for everyone particularly people in the, in the less developed regions where economic growth can lift people from poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Professor, thank you very much. And on that note, we need to wrap up our session. Just remains for me to thank all of our speakers today. A really insightful and fascinating uh, discussion uh, on, on this very important issue. Uh, and many thanks to, to IE University and CKGSB for bringing the report to us. Have a look at the report, please. I'm sure we can download it and we'll send you the link, uh, Fuel the Soft Power, the Role of High-Tech Companies in Soft Power. Um, thank you all for being with us. Thanks to the audience. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of your questions, but those who we did manage to get to, very grateful for your input. Uh, take very good care, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.